In the previous video we looked at Nikam which added stereo to PAL TV transmissions. Now if you thought there was only one type of stereo for PAL you would be wrong because of course there was another way of doing it and that was the German way. So today we're going to be talking about Zweikanalton also known as Zweiton or A2 stereo in English. And once again this is an obsolete technology and unlikely to still be in use anywhere in the world. Now unlike Nikam which was a radical new paradigm for the distribution and transmission of audio, this was shall we say a more conservative approach and of course it is entirely analog. And also unlike Nikam this was a transmission only technology so there's not going to be quite so much backstory. Now, in terms of public transmissions A2 stereo predates Nikam by about a decade or so and was nowhere near as popular and was only adopted by a handful of countries outside of the German speaking world. And of course for this video we've got a couple of new bits of kit. This here is a Rodenschwarz FATF. Now in the previous video we saw the Philips PM5688 which is a broadcast monitoring NICAM receiver. Well this is the equivalent of it for this system and as far as I know this is a unique item. Certainly I'm not aware of any other example of such a thing for this standard. Also here we have a Philips PM5588. Now this is the A2 stereo modulator that we're going to be using in this video. And the 5588 is quite an unusual product in that it is a standalone. And I'm not aware of any other example of such a thing because normally for this system the sound modulator would be built into the vision modulator. Now this is an item that was only offered very briefly in the early to mid 1980s and it appears to have been a sticking plaster A2 stereo solution while Philips worked on their own single box modulator for the system. And the modulator product that they had at the time was the 5580 which dates back to the beginning of color television. It wasn't designed with stereo in mind and it would have been pretty difficult to upgrade it so that is why we have this unusual item. And certainly when they released a single box solution the 5588 disappeared never to be spoken of again. I actually found an interesting application in Australia where it was used to upgrade older monitor transmitters to stereo. So this thing, you already heard me try to pronounce it. Now one thing I am not going to try to pronounce is the name of the institution who developed it. In English it is the Institute for Broadcasting Technology which of course is based in Germany. And we don't need to look any further than the list of technologies that they have worked on to appreciate that these guys are among the heavyweights of broadcast engineering. Now despite that this technology only had two major wins outside of the German speaking world and that was the Netherlands and Australia. To have been more successful they would have needed to have convinced the BBC to adopt it because they were very influential in the power world. Now I have heard that the author of this paragraph was the architect of stereo sound at the BBC and well lip service there but no cigar. Now this technology being based on FM and being stereo was sometimes assumed to be the same FM stereo that was used for radio. However it most certainly was not. Now let's just have a quick recap of how an FM stereo transmitter works for comparison. And this is the kind of thing that many will have built as a hobby project so apologies if I'm boring you with something that you already know. Now FM stereo was of course backwards compatible with earlier mono radios and this was achieved by summing the left and right channels and modulating them exactly as they were before. Now, the stereo was achieved by modulating a different signal as a double sideband with a carrier frequency of 38 kHz. This was then combined with the left and right sum signal and then the 19 kHz pilot tone which was then used to help receivers detect a stereo transmission. This of course was all fed to a single FM modulator which I haven't shown in this diagram. Now the advantage of this arrangement is that the resulting signal consumes very little bandwidth on the airways which is desirable because the FM radio spectrum is small and very precious. The disadvantage is that there is quite a lot of crosstalk between the channels but because each channel is always the same program it's not likely to be noticed. Now let's compare that to A2 stereo and this is not a diagram I drew myself however it is very much in the spirit of what we just looked at. Now what happens here depends on how the transmitter is configured. For stereo the left and right are summed and sent to the modulator which transmits on the frequency used by the traditional mono carrier for backwards compatibility with older mono receivers. The right channel is sent directly to the companion modulator which transmits an additional carrier and the receiver has to subtract half of the amplitude of channel 2 from channel 1 to recover the true left channel. Now for dual channel mode which was used for bilingual programs the inputs pass directly to the modulators and note that unlike FM stereo there were actually two separate modulators and this is to eliminate crosstalk which of course would be very undesirable in this mode. And channel 2 also carries a pilot tone not too dissimilar to FM stereo however it has a low frequency AM tone modulated into it which helps receivers identify whether the transmission is stereo or dual mono. 
Now it is time for our obligatory look at the Spectrum Analyzer. Now if you have seen my previous videos, this is going to be looking pretty familiar to you. Now the carrier second from the right is of course our FM mono audio carrier, exactly as it was in the previous videos, but this time around it is coming from the 5588. Now I have had to disable the 5680's FM modulator for this experiment, because of course it would clash. And the highest frequency carrier is what is new here, and that is what carries the second audio channel. And it sits around about the frequency of the NICAM carrier that we saw previously, and that is why these two systems cannot coexist. Now this is a very significant point about the system, in that the two FM carriers are quite some distance apart from each other, 242 kHz to be precise, and that is what gives such exceptional isolation between the two channels, making it suitable for dual audio programs, where of course we don't want any crosstalk. Now I'm just going to zoom in on that second channel and we can see there is something quite interesting here. There is a very weak double sideband modulated onto it. And you could argue that this is a sub-sub carrier and this is what carries the pilot tone which is used by receivers to identify the configuration of the transmission. Now this receiver actually gives us the ability to demodulate that pilot tone so we can have a look at it. Now, one of the things I was kind of surprised about with it, despite it being a TV dual sound demodulator, it's actually only capable of demodulating one channel at a time. So presently I'm outputting the channel number one, which we can see on the frequency counter has a one kilohertz tone coming out of it, which of course is the test tone that I've currently got selected here. To demodulate the pilot tone, what I have to do is press this pilot button and then we have to switch it into AM mode. And as far as I can tell, the only reason the AM mode is there is specifically for this one purpose, which is to modulate the pilot tone, because that is, of course, AM modulated, and obviously the main sound carriers are FM modulated. Now we can see on the frequency counter here, we've got a 117 hertz tone coming from our output here, of course. That is the tone that identifies a stereo transmission. Now if I push the dual button on the front of this, and that does make a very satisfying click. Now we can see that tone has changed to 274 hertz, which is about what we would expect to indicate that this is a dual transmission. Now if you watched the previous video, you might remember that I was quite surprised to find that my Samsung television, which I purchased only relatively recently, still supported NICAM. Now wouldn't it be funny if it also supports A2 stereo? Well, I have a funny feeling that it might. So let's put this thing back into stereo mode and go over into the other room and switch on that TV and see if we get anything out of it. Here we are again at my modern Samsung television. Now the 5588 is presently in its test mode, which means it is transmitting a different tone on each channel. So if we can hear both of those, that would be a pretty good indication that we've got stereo here. And there it is, clearly two different tones. Now let's have a look in the menus and see what we can see. So in the dual sound menu, there it is, stereo. So it works. So now I'm going to switch it into dual mode. Now I can tell you, I never get tired of pushing those buttons. Now let's go back into the other room and see if this works. Now in the dual mode, I would only expect to be able to hear one tone. And yeah, there's just one tone. So let's have a look in the menus and see what shows up this time. So we've got a dual one and a dual two. So if I select the dual two, I think we're going to hear that other tone. There it is. So it still works, which is fantastic. Now there is just one last mode to try it here, and that of course is mono. So let's push that button now, and I think you can guess what's going to happen. So if we have a look on the spectrum analyzer, we can see that that companion modulator has now just been switched off. So we've basically reverted back to a 1970s style true mono transmission. Now because this video is quite a bit shorter than the last, I've decided to fatten it up with a comparison to NICAM, which of course is what we looked at in the previous video. Now I did ponder whether or not I would go to the trouble of doing a full technical comparison, but as this video isn't going to be driving your purchase decisions, perhaps that might have been a little bit pointless. And even if you do happen to have a time machine stashed in your garden shed, there is of course that other slight problem that A2 Stereo couldn't coexist with NICAM anyway, so you've very much got what you got. The biggest benefit of A2 Stereo was full backwards compatibility with earlier mono systems. It was very much built on top of those systems, not alongside them like NICAM. And that means it was much cheaper and easier to both transmit and receive because there was fundamentally nothing new to be developed. It was just a tweak on what was already there. 
Finally, and this is disputed, A2 Stereo could be argued to be better at handling poor signal quality scenarios, where typically NICAM would drop out and the receiver would revert back to mono. And because A2 Stereo is using that same technology, at least there would still be stereo, but it may not be all that great. One of the biggest benefits of NICAM is that there is no possibility of crosstalk between the video and audio signals. And they shouldn't be for A2 Stereo either, however in the case of a particularly poorly designed receiver, or perhaps one that was faulty, this was sometimes a problem. And the other benefit of course is the possibility of end-to-end -end digital from source to viewer, which we talked about in the previous video. But because of the difficulty in implementing it, I don't think this was done outside of the UK. And there were a couple of other benefits, which I've listed here, that I doubt were ever experienced by consumers. The number one drawback of NICAM was the high cost of receivers. Now this is the inside of an early NICAM receiver, and everything we're looking at here is additional to the circuitry needed to receive the traditional FM mono audio signal. Now at the end of the 1980s, this was all pretty cutting edge stuff, and as you can imagine, it was priced accordingly. That was very contrasting to the situation with A2 Stereo. There were many different single chip demodulators over the years, however, this one is of particular interest because it can demodulate all analog stereo systems. Now, at this point, I would consider the silicon situation to be mature, at least for analog, and that was at the time NICAM was launched. Now, of course, there were further levels of integration later on, however, those are outside of the scope of this video. I couldn't find any pricing information, however, I wouldn't expect this chip to have been very expensive because, frankly, all they have done is just doubled up a mono demodulator chip, and that is not something that anyone would have been able to charge a premium for. For NICAM, things took quite a lot longer to mature, and there were many different receiver solutions over the years. This one is of particular interest because for the first time, the entire job of receiving was now done by a single chip. Now this would have made a big difference to the cost of receivers, but did it bring stereo to people who had to watch every penny that they spent? Absolutely not. Now if we look at the block diagrams, and apologies for this being on its side, it's very hard to read vertically in a YouTube video, and we can see that this thing is insanely complicated. And at the time it would have been the most complicated chip inside of any TV or VCRs, and many of the functions inside of it had only just been developed, so of course there would have been a juicy premium on it. And that is on top of the additional premium arising from the need for separate receiver models for the NICAM market. And that was my experience walking into appliance stores. Even in the late 1990s, NICAM receivers were still sold at a premium. And in my school year at the time, it was pretty much only the rich kids who had NICAM, and I only had access to it myself through extended family. Now frustratingly, it was common to find A2 stereo capable receivers on the streets, even though it wasn't the standard that we use in New Zealand. And I can assure you, I never once saw a NICAM receiver of any sort discarded in such a fashion, because I didn't live in a place where people could afford to buy them at all, let alone throw them away. The NICAM Premium wasn't a raise until the early 2000s when receivers moved to a more integrated architecture where everything was done in a small number of chips and eventually in a single chip, and specifically those chips were the same whichever market the product was sold into. Now unfortunately for NICAM, by this point it was already halfway through its life, and in some countries already supplanted by digital television. And as much as it was an innovative and technically superior solution, unfortunately it spent half of its life as a technology for the well-off. Now, A2 Stereo, on the other hand, was affordable to all for at least two-thirds of its life. And just for your information, here's that Stereo Sound Systems comparison slide from the previous video. Now this time around I've added the frequency response, just in case there was any questions about the actual sound quality here. Well, frankly, they're all basically exactly the same. Now that is the end of this video. Now you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, I didn't really talk about these controls or displays on here. Well, actually I did back in my first video, and they're just for setting the FM deviation. And they're also present on this vision modulator. So I will link to that video in the description. Now also we've got these really nice pieces of equipment here, which I just haven't really done justice. So at some point in the future, I'll try and make time to do some quick teardown videos so we can get a better idea of how these things actually work. Anyway, for now, that is all. So thanks for watching.